Now that Pope Francis has completed his mission to the United States, it is time for a little bit of reflection as to what happened during that visit. When we discussed what was going to happen, I think we summed up more or less what he was going to do. There was one or two surprises, but generally speaking, it was a masterpiece of media and social performance. When Pope Francis arrived in his airplane and it landed and he was greeted by the President and the Vice President of the United States of America and his family, there was a reception such as had never been afforded any foreign dignity in the history of the United States. And I'll tell you, as the plane pulled up, I watched the crowd here lean up against the fences that are around the grandstands here, every one of them pushing forward with, with, with a phone or a camera in their hands to capture this moment. You're watching now, as you can see, that red carpet about to roll out. It was interesting, about an hour ago, we saw them roll out the red carpet. And we thought, oh, they've rolled out the red carpet. That was just a practice run. They have practiced everything to a T here, including that perfectly lined up honor guard you're seeing there as well. They want to get this right. It's a special moment. It's a historic moment. We, we got a remarkable seat here. So I have to tell you, Jake, and I've seen official visits before. I haven't seen one quite like this. The aircraft with which, is la which he landed and all subsequent aircraft received the code Shepard 1. And then the symbolic meaning of his visit. The pomp and ceremony surrounding his, his visit alone speaks of the high esteem in which the world holds this pontiff. It's an extraordinary moment. First of all, the joy is palpable, not only here, the joy in Philadelphia as we're talking here, as we're waiting here. There's thousands, 17,000 delegates to the World Meeting of Families watching this great event in Philadelphia. The people of New York, very, very happy that he's coming. What's happening here is for the whole world. The world is watching this particular visit. For me personally, the, the Holy Father is, is the Vicar of Christ. He's, he's our leader. He's our shepherd. And when you know the shepherd, it makes an even bigger difference. One of his first acts on his American tour was the canonization of the Spanish saint, Junipero Serra. Now this in itself speaks books, volumes of what was the agenda of the papacy. We remember a one of those testimonies that supo testimoniar in estas tierras La alegría del Evangelio, Fray Junipero Serra. This Spanish saint was part of the Spanish Californian mission, and he was at one stage an inquisitor. He was part of the Inquisition, and he ruled with ruthlessness. There was much controversy surrounding this man seeing that uh, some of the, the Native Americans were highly upset and, and accused him even of genocidal activity. The Pope used this canonization to reflect on the Catholic mission in the United States. And coupled with this mission, of course, you have the issue of immigration, which played a major part in his tour the reception of the immigrant. He referred to himself as an American, saying that the boundaries really were irrelevant and that the boundaries should be, the borders should be open for those of the southern states to enter in. Now, why was America founded in the first place? America was founded because the Puritans and the Christians in Europe fled the tyranny of papal persecution. 
They fled to this land which opened its arms to receive them. And they wanted a land that was free from the tyranny of persecution on religious grounds. So here was a Protestant nation. And today there's this great controversy about the borders and how to contain the immigration into this nation. And the Pope turned it round. He would like to see those borders open because then the nation would be flooded with Catholicism. Protestantism would be obliterated and pushed into the background. Now, to canonize this person, Junipero Serra, as a saint, was a very strange act indeed, particularly looking at the history of this man. Coming with the Spaniards into California, creating missions, using the Indians basically as slave labor, and he was, he was a person that used self-flagellation, which was common in the Middle Ages. Martin Luther, when he was still a Roman Catholic, did that because somehow he had to do penance for his sins. But Junipero took it to extremes. He wore garments that were spiked with wires and with boar hairs to create constant pain to himself. He flagellated himself to the point of total collapse. And this, uh, this is the attribute which is called saintly. It is a total denial of the vicarious death of Jesus Christ who became sin for me, who took upon himself my sinfulness so that he paid the price for it. In him I am free. I have no need for the works of self-flagellation. This was an act of open controversy, denying the very pro Protestant principles on which the United States were based. Consequently, after this canonization, it's interesting that uh, it was probably, so they believe, Native Americans actually defaced the statues of Junipera Serra in an act of defiance, throwing paint upon them and writing words of a derogatory nature over the tombstones, etc. So not everybody was well pleased with this first gesture of the Pope. When he was greeted at the White House, it was the most illustrious ceremony ever afforded a foreign dignitary. He was referred to as the example of humility to mankind. And in his speech, he also referred to the immigrant issue and that everybody was at one stage an immigrant and that the doors should be open, that America should be one. So this, this theme was very recurring in his, in his speeches. The most interesting one was, of course, the Capitol. Now the Capitol, as we discussed previously, is a fascinating building and it actually refers back to ancient Rome the Capitol, which is a Roman idea. And it is, a, it is basically a copy of St. Peter's. It is a temple. So in a sense, the shepherd one was entering into the temple. Mr. Speaker, the Pope of the Holy See. And there he stood and gave his speech between the fascia, the two great fascia in this wonderful arena. And what did the fascia actually refer to? These bundles of rods tied together. This was what the Romans used when the Roman leader would take the nations and the clans and bind them to himself with cords and the one strong man in the middle 
became the norm of unity for all of them. This was the man of the moment stepping in between the fasciae. He immediately pointed across the hall to the relief of Moses and he spoke about the law. Now it's interesting that this relief of Moses is surrounded by a laurel wreath. Now a laurel wreath is distinctly Roman but of course it's not only the centerpiece of Moses that is displayed there in the Capitol but on the sides are the reliefs of other great dignitaries of the past that were associated with the law and it's fascinating that Hammurabi for example is there displayed also with the laurel wreath and Hammurabi's law was a very harsh law totally contrary to the law of God then you had uh, Pope Innocent for example as one of the great examples of law giving so this is a total Catholic setting it's a very Roman setting indeed now when we, we think back over history and you think of Herod's temple for example Herod constructed the this, this second temple and it wasn't nearly as spectacular as the first temple but he, he dedicated that temple not to the God of Israel but he had a Roman eagle placed at the entrance in a sense dedicating it to Rome and the, the Jewish zealots were very very upset and some of them went and defaced that Roman eagle and Herod had them hunted down and tortured to death. You cannot take the things of God and dedicate them to a pagan system. That is syncretism. Syncretism is something that God has constantly warned against in his Bible. You cannot worship God by the means of Baal. You cannot take God's law and package it in Roman law. So this statue or this relief rather of Moses that the Pope referred to Yours is a walk which makes me reflect in two ways on the figure of Moses. When you look at it there embodied in its Roman system it actually tells us literally that this law of Moses is packaged in the legal system of Rome. And if we understand that Rome changed the law of God and gave its own flavor to the law of God, then this becomes even more apparent. And here was the first citizen of the world, the re-embodiment of Osiris, the great God, because as we mentioned before, the Pope had seated himself just prior to this event on the great white throne between the cherubim showing that he is God and his morality was to become the morality of the world he referred to climate change and of course he was rather clever he used the the great historic figures of the United States to bring across his points he used Abraham Lincoln to argue against any form of polarization. He used Thomas Merton to argue that there should be peace amongst religions and that any form of fundamentalism is a danger to faith and that no religion is immune from fundamentalism. Fundamentalism was, was a major portion of this way of thinking. And what is fundamentalism? According to the dictionary, fundamentalism is a form of Protestantism that takes the Bible literally, that believes in a literal creation, that believes in a resurrection, that believes in a virgin birth, that believes in the second coming. In other words, if you take your Bible literally, then you are a fundamentalist. And according to the Vatican, fundamentalism is a major problem in the world today and needs to be curtailed. Dorothy Day was the great example of social justice. All the Catholic doctrines espoused in the individual's 
that he mentioned. Martin Luther King, the foreigner, the disenfranchised, how to accept them. It was brilliantly done and very convincing. But the deep undertones of Catholic social justice were very, very apparent. And if we understand Roman Catholic social justice, then we will know that it is based not on the capitalistic idea of social justice, but on the Thomas Aquinas idea that basically you possess nothing and Rome is the one that determines the distribution and the equity of all goods and property. The Roman Catholic view on the right to life and abortion, these were all issues that were highlighted by the Pope. It's interesting that some of the, the members of the House of the Republican Party had actually boycotted this, this meeting. Uh, and uh, it's fascinating to me what the, the Jesuit commentator on CNN had to say about it. Because the people who boycotted it, or the person who boycotted it, was actually Jesuit trained. And when this was pointed out, the Jesuit on CNN said, well, Jesuits are known to be on both sides of the question. Part of the Hegelian di dialectic. It's interesting, when I look at the undercurrent and the, the subliminal messages that were in this trip, then they, are, they speak actually more than the words that were actually spoken. Isn't it interesting that he should highlight the immigration question while some of the Republican candidates were speaking so strongly against it about borders and walls and gates. He was opening up the world. Here was this new global village where everybody felt welcome and everybody was one. One wonders whether some of the pre-speeches were choreographed in order to emphasize the contrast to Pope Francis. Some of the other subliminal little issues that I find interesting is the way in which he traveled, which the media picked up as, as humility. For example, he traveled in his little Fiat next to these great Suburbans that were driving in front and behind him. And they pointed this out frequently as a sign of humility. But these vehicles were chosen very carefully and they were chosen by the Vatican itself. The news tells us that the vehicles were chosen by the Vatican. Now the word fiat, of course, has an interesting connotation. To rule by fiat means to have absolute authority. So driving in the fiat means absolute authority. For example, the dictionary would say, the headmaster made a fiat decree that such and such was to be the case and that was that. So fiat, ruling was absolute authority. The other vehicle chosen by the Pope and the Vatican, well in advance to this meeting, was of course the Pope Mobile, which was a Jeep Wrangler. Now, this name in itself is, is fascinating. A Wrangler is of course someone who controls the herds. And Jeep also is interesting because it comes from Eugene the Jeep, which is uh, the creature that we find in the Popeye cartoons. But this was a very interesting creature because he was, he was a mythological creature almost. He could transmigrate between the dimensions and he had a solution to every problem. So he was a being of a higher, of a higher norm and a higher fashion. This creature, if you could transcend the dimensions, is uh, like an angelic being. Isn't that interesting that the year 2015 was declared by the United Nations as the year of light? And uh, they dedicated to, of course, uh, technology and light technology. But to declare this year the year of light, 
It, it reminds me of the French foreign minister who spoke about the 500 days to, pre, to the prevention of the climate catastrophe and the descending into the abyss. And the 500 days culminated exactly with this papal visit. And here you have the United Nations declaring this year, 2015, as the year of light. Now, the Latin for that is Anno Lucis. And this is used in Freemasonry. Freemasonry dates all its events by Anno Lucis, the year of light. And if you look at Freemasonic cornerstones, for example, or commemorative uh, stones, then you will find the date of the present, let's say the year 2015, and you will find it in Anulusus, where they add 4,000 years to this period. And this is also the year in which the Pope spoke at the United Nations. Now, previous Popes had also spoken at the United Nations, but this was different to any other previous Pope, because this was also the 70th year of the commemoration of the founding of the United Nations, and it is the first time in history that a Pope spoke to all the assembled world leaders. All previous Popes had merely spoken to the ambassadors of the various states. But here, all the world leaders were present. And his message was of particular importance for this time. Of course, steeped in the issue of climate change. He spoke about human rights, dispelling the collective forms of human selfishness. He spoke about equity. He spoke about access, distribution, equitable distribution, fairness, all these great words. He referred to his predecessors who had also spoken about these issues. And this reminds me of Pope Benedict's speech when he touted human rights as God-given. And he referred to Benedict and his speech in terms of human rights. And Benedict had also made it quite clear that human rights were based on natural law. So it's not based on divine law. And natural law is, of course, the basis upon which Roman Catholicism bases its authority. And why it claims that it can change the law of God because it doesn't base it on scripture, but on natural law. And who is the one who exemplifies natural law? The Pope himself, because from his elevated position of observation, according to Benedict, he is the one who surveys the landscape and decides what is morally right and what is morally wrong. And uh, if you take this together with Ban Ki-moon's statements that the, the moral stature of the Pope was not to be denied, then this all comes together. Of course, he referred to the law being inscribed in, in the heart, and uh, he brought this into connection with the environment, referring, of course, also to the November meeting in Paris, where legislation will have to be put in place. Now, during his visit, he didn't mention Sunday legislation in particular, but prior to his visit, he did state that Sunday is to be the heart of the new dispensation. And in his encyclical on the environment, he also elevated Sunday. And if we look at some of the news media's reports on this summit in Paris, then it becomes obvious that uh, this will also be a point of question. Just a few months earlier, The Guardian, for example, had said, if we should set Sunday aside as a day of rest, it would contribute greatly to fighting climate change, because then industry would come to rest at least one day in the week and contribute greatly to a lowering of the carbon damage to our planet. So all of these issues were embodied in these speeches. 
He made a great moral appeal for working together, for uh, accepting the responsibility for the state of the planet, ridding the world of the fear of nuclear war. All of these issues were, of course, endearing. And he received standing ovations at all his speeches, whether it was at the Capitol or at the United Nations. And to avert the most serious effects of the environmental deterioration caused by human activity. I'm convinced that we can make a difference. I'm sure. And God bless you all. What is very interesting is that the subsequent speeches by the world leaders were almost more fascinating than the speeches by Francis himself. President Obama came across at the United Nations as the father of the human family, as the one who wanted to create this equity and this fairness. He referred to Russia and its role and that no nation was to interfere with the sovereignty or the territory of another nation. He referred to the Iran deal as uh, creating peace, that he had no intention of taking someone's territory or having any economic interests whatsoever, but that the United States was there to ensure this fairness and this democracy and this equity. He was like a father figure, a brilliant speech. But he referred to Pope Francis and he also spoke about religious extremism that it should be curtailed at all costs. Obama, after castigating religious sectarianism, said they needed a, a stronger United Nations and he referred to the 50 nations that would come together to create a greater military capacity in the United Nations to oversee peacekeeping missions in the world with many, many boots on the ground, a strong military component to the United Nations. So here was one speaking as the leader of the human family. King Abdullah of Jordan also made some very interesting statements. He said, religious extremism must not have access to the media in any form. And he said the war is between religious moderates and extremists of all faiths. Basically he was referring to hate speech and uh, creating religious turmoil in the world. A very strong speech indeed. Religious polarization has to be curtailed. And as Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, the Jesuit, who was the father, as it were, of the philosophy of the United Nations, had said, the only way forward is all together. And we need to focus on a Messiah that satisfies them all. So an extreme view would be, of course, to say that Jesus is the only way to salvation. That would be an extreme view that would exclude other religious sects and other religious systems. If you want to stick to the faith that there is salvation in no other name than that of Jesus Christ, then you will be branded as a fundamentalist. 
I believe the world is moving in that direction. And I'd be interested to know what kind of legislation will come out of the Paris meeting when all the nations will have to commit to certain issues. But whether it happens there or whether it happens later is irrelevant. I believe we are on a course that cannot be reversed any longer where there will be a confrontation between those that say all together and those that say come out and be separate says the Lord and I will receive you. Either Jesus is the only way to salvation on this planet or he is not. And every single individual on this planet will have to make a choice. Either I accept the morality and the law of God as the standard of righteousness, or I accept the law as modulated by Rome and changed by Rome as the standard. As for me and my household, we have decided we will serve the Lord.